OK, so we're going to solve this differential equation using a trick. Then we'll see where this trick comes from and how it works. And this might feel quite similar to using an integrating factor technique, only now we're using this for a second order derivative with a second derivative there. So our first step to solve this is actually just to multiply through everything by x squared. So this is going to give us, first of all, the second derivative multiplied by x squared. We'll write the second derivative just using this prime notation, y double prime, to mean the second derivative of y. Then our next term becomes 4x times dy dx, we'll write as y prime. And the last term just gives us a 2y, and this is all still equal to 0. And the reason we've done this is now this expression looks a bit more like the sort of thing you might get by differentiating something twice using the product rule. So you can see here we've got x squared, we've got the second derivative of y, and then we've got almost a 2x in the middle here, and then just a 2 on the outside. So let's have a look at what happened if we had x squared times y, and we wanted to differentiate this twice. So here we're differentiating this twice. So first of all, if we just differentiate this once, we differentiate using the product rule. So the derivative of y gives us a y prime times x squared. So we get x squared times y prime, and then differentiating the x squared, we add 2x times y. So we've differentiated this once, we need to differentiate again though to get the second derivative. And now differentiating this first pair of terms using the product rule again, we get x squared times y double prime, and then differentiating the x squared terms gives us a 2x y prime, and then we can do the same with this term here. So we get another 2x times y prime from differentiating the y. So another 2x times y prime. And finally, differentiating the 2x just gives us 2 times y, so plus 2 times y. And then you can see this is actually the original expression we had here. So we've got our 2xy prime plus another 2xy prime is equal to our 4xy prime. So then we can conclude that this second derivative is actually equal to the left-hand side here. And this is really useful now because we can say that the second derivative of x squared times y is just equal to zero. And this allows us to solve the differential equation. We can just integrate on both sides now. So integrating once, we get x squared times y. Just the first derivative of this is going to be some constant, which we can call a. And then when we integrate on the left-hand side here, if we get another constant there, we can just absorb that into our a on the right-hand side. So we don't need an extra plus c here. And then if we integrate again, on the right-hand side, we're going to have now ax plus another constant, which we can call b. And on the left-hand side, we integrate this, we just get x squared times y. And any constant there would be absorbed into the b like before. So then we can read off our solution to the differential equation then, just dividing through by x squared. y is going to be ax plus b all over x squared. Or we could even write this as two separate fractions if you prefer. So we could write it as y equals a over x plus b over x squared, where a and b are some real constants here. And of course we can't have x equal to zero, but I don't think this is particularly problematic because even in the original differential equation, defining the problem, we couldn't have x equal to zero there. And now to see where this trick comes from, we'll first of all look at the integrating factor technique just for first order differential equations. So the integrating factor technique works for first order differential equations of this form, We've got dy dx plus some function of x times y is equal to some other function of x. And here, the integrating factor means that we need to multiply by a certain function, which we call our integrating factor. And here, the function that we multiply is always e to the integral of px dx, so e to the integral of this p function here next to the y. So why do we multiply by this? Well, we're basically looking for what could we multiply by to make the left-hand side look like something you would get from differentiating the product of two functions. So you can see here we've differentiated y here, and here we're differentiating the function of x. It should be multiplied by px. So we're basically looking for a function which, when you differentiate it, the derivative is px times that original function. And this is exactly that function. So if we just write this out, e to the integral of px dx, and then we differentiate this. We apply the chain rule to e to the power of some function. We need to first of all differentiate that function and then multiply by that on the outside. So what happens when you differentiate the integral of p? Well, you just get the original function p back. So we'd have px, and then this just gets multiplied by e to the original function, so e to the integral of 
px dx. So you can see that this function does, when you differentiate it, just get multiplied by px. So then if we look at what would happen if we differentiated this function times y, then we'll get the e to the integral of px dx multiplied by y, the first derivative of this, we get, first of all, differentiating the y, we just get e to this integral times y prime. But then when we differentiate this function, we get plus px times e to this integral times y. And then you can see here, this is exactly the left-hand side of our differential equation, just multiplied by e to this integral. And then this is also equal to then multiplying qx by e to this integral, so e to the integral of px dx multiplied by qx. So I'll just fill this in as well. So px dx here, and this one is also px dx. So then you can see that on the left-hand side, this is just a simple derivative. So then we could just integrate, and we would get e to this integral times y. And then so long as you can integrate this product on the right-hand side, you'll be able to solve the differential equation quite easily then. But that can, of course, be the difficulty if this right-hand side isn't nice to integrate, the method might not work so well. So then if we want to use a similar method for a second-order differential equation, we could look at what happens if we have e to this integral times y and find the second derivative of this. So let's write this out. So e to the integral of px dx times y, the second derivative. So we've already calculated the first derivative here, so now we can just find the second derivative by differentiating all of these terms with respect to x. So if we differentiate this product, first of all, we differentiate y prime, we just get y double prime, the second derivative of y. So we get e to the integral of px dx times y double prime, and then differentiating e to the integral of px dx, we just get p times e to this integral. So we get plus px times e to the integral of p, and then multiplied by y prime. So we've differentiated these terms, and then we've got this extra term to differentiate here as well. So if we differentiate the y, we're going to get y prime multiplied by p multiplied by e to the integral of p. So it's actually a repeat of this term here. So we can just introduce, instead of plus 1 times this, we can have plus 2 lots of this. So we've differentiated the y term there. And then to differentiate these x terms, we've actually got the product of two functions of x here. So we're going to get another two terms out from multiplying differentiating this using the product rule. So first of all, differentiating the p term, we get a p prime derivative of p multiplied by e to the integral of p multiplied by y. And then secondly, when we differentiate e to the integral of p, we just multiply everything by p and leave this alone. So we also get plus another factor of p. So we have px all squared times e to the integral of p multiplied by y. So you can see here we can factorise out e to the integral of p. So we can write out e to the integral of px dx multiplied by, then we've got y double prime plus 2px times y prime. And then here we've got p prime plus px squared multiplied by y. So we'll write this as the derivative of p plus px all squared multiplied by y. So then you can see now, this is the sort of thing we're looking for. So if our left-hand side of our second-order differential equation was of this form, so we want our left-hand side to be of this form, then we could multiply through by e to the integral of this p function on both sides and potentially be able to solve our differential equation. So let's see what this looks like in practice applied to our example from the start. So the first thing we'd do if we wanted to use this method is check that our differential equation is actually in this form that we're looking for. So the easiest way to start here would be to check that our coefficient of dy dx matches up, so 2 times px should be 4 over x. So we want to try px is equal to 2 over x, so that 2 times this gives us the coefficient 4 over x. And then we want to calculate what is p prime plus p squared, so we can differentiate this and then square it. So when we differentiate 2 over x, we get negative 2 over x squared, and when we square this, we just get 4 over x squared. And then when we add these two together, we get 2 over x squared. So this is what we want as our coefficient of y, and you can see that this matches up. 
So this differential equation is indeed of the correct form that we can apply this method now. So now we know that we're going to have an integrating factor of e to the integral of this function p. So our p function is 2 over x. We've got e to the integral of 2 over x with respect to x. And we can think of this integral as being like 2 times the integral of 1 over x dx. So we can write it as e to the 2 times the integral of 1 over x is just ln of the modulus of x. We can't have ln of a negative here. And then we've also got plus a constant. And with the constant here, you can think of this using your laws of indices as instead of plus c, taking the whole expression and just multiplying this by e to the power of c. And it's quite interesting. If you think about what we're going to do with this integrating factor, we're going to multiply both sides of the equation by this. So it doesn't really add anything. There's no benefit to having the plus c here because we're just multiplying both sides of an equation by the same number. So this is perhaps the only scenario in maths where you're actually encouraged not to have the plus c when you carry out an indefinite integral like this. So then we've got e to the power of 2 times ln modulus of x. And we can think of this as e to the ln modulus of x all squared. And then you can see that e and the ln cancel, so it's just the modulus of x squared, which is just equal to x squared. So this explains how at the start we knew we could just multiply by x squared then, and then we would turn this equation into a differential equation that's much easier to solve. So then our integrating factor is x squared, and therefore when we multiply by this, the left-hand side of the differential equation becomes just this nice product, x squared times y, the second derivative of this. And the right-hand side, we just had 0 times x squared, so it's just equal to 0. And then you can see we can solve the differential equation like before. So now we can use this method to solve even more differential equations. So there's a few examples here you could have a go at yourself if you're interested. I think for the first two, you could perhaps work out without necessarily having to do e to the integral of the p function. You might be able to work out what you need to multiply by on both sides. But I think the third one is much more subtle, and that's really interesting. I don't think it's at all obvious what you would need to multiply by without calculating e to the integral of the p function. But rather than going through some more and some harder examples, there's a really cool application of this method which we can use to find quite a nice way of deriving the formula when we have repeated roots in an auxiliary equation type differential equation. So if we've got one like this, where we've got take away 2 alpha and plus alpha squared there as our coefficients, we're looking for our px function would just be negative alpha. So if we've got px is negative alpha, let's just check that this is of the right form. So when we differentiate this, we're actually just going to get 0 because it's a constant, it's not a function of x. So we're going to get 0 plus p squared, so this is just alpha squared, which is indeed our coefficient of y. So we know then that we have something of the correct form, and then our integrating factor is going to be e to the integral of just negative alpha with respect to x. So this gives us e to the negative alpha x, and remember we don't include the plus c there. So then we know that we need to multiply by e to the negative alpha x on both sides. So we're going to get e to the negative alpha x times the second derivative of y minus 2 alpha e to the negative alpha x times the first derivative of y plus alpha squared e to the negative alpha x times y. And this is just equal to 0 still on the right hand side. So then you can check, you can do the second derivative if you like, if you're interested. But this is going to turn into just the second derivative then of e to the negative alpha x times y is equal to 0. And then we can solve this just by integrating on both sides. So if we integrate, first of all, we'll get a constant on the right hand side, we'll call this b. So we've still got e to the negative alpha x times y, but just the first derivative now. And any constant on the left hand side gets absorbed into this b. And then integrating again, we get e to the negative alpha x times y is equal to, integrating b, we get b times x plus some other constant, which we can call a. And then we can just multiply by e to the alpha x on both sides to see that the solution then is going to be y equals, we'll write these the other way around, a plus b times x multiplied by e to the alpha x. So this provides a really nice natural derivation of this formula and explains somewhat where this a plus bx comes from in the case where we've got repeated roots using the auxiliary equation method.
So recently I made a video on this case where we have the repeated roots, particularly looking at a few different ways of understanding where this bx term comes from in contrast with what we get when we have distinct or complex roots. And I wish I'd actually included this derivation because I think this gives us some more insight into what's going on. So if you look at the other examples, if we're using the auxiliary equation where you have distinct roots or complex or imaginary roots, it turns out that those differential equations aren't going to be of this correct form. So the only differential equation where we can use the auxiliary equation, and we can also use this second order integrating factor technique where it's in this form, is exactly when we have repeated roots like this. So I think this just emphasises how the repeated roots case is a really interesting special case, and then it also gives us quite a nice satisfying natural derivation we can follow to see exactly why this bx term arises then in the case where we've got repeated roots.